Welcome to Jack's conference. Uh, I'm here with Neil Ford from ThoughtWorks. Hello. Neil, great to have you here. Welcome to Jack's. You just had a keynote about uh, functional programming. Yes, five reasons you should care about functional programming, even if you don't care about Closure, Scala, or F-Sharp. Okay. And what was your key message to the, to the audience? Well, the, the point is that all the languages that you're using on a daily basis are becoming functional languages, whether you want them to or not. So Java's adding lambdas. Uh, languages uh, like Groovy have added these really advanced functional features like memoization. So that one of the thrusts of the talk was, you know, your language is evolving and the ecosystem is evolving underneath you. One of the points I make is that, you know, one of the, the really nice huge benefits we got from Java was garbage collection. And nobody thinks anything, you know, nobody would ever want to go back to manual garbage collection. We're getting similar kind of benefits now in functional programming languages like, for example, Clojure does for concurrency what Java did for garbage collection because you can write really high performance concurrent applications in Clojure never once think about multi-threaded because all that detail has been encapsulated away by the language and so that's one of the reasons that a functional programming languages or those techniques whether you're in a language that's called functional or not are going to show up in your language because they're showing up in all these languages because we have enough uh, infrastructure and runtime and horsepower to be able to do these sophisticated mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. Uh, at the end, you mentioned uh, your own pyramid, uh, Neil's pyramid of, of imperative, I think, functional and domain specific languages. Perhaps you can elaborate about that. Yep. Uh, so back in 2006, I wrote a blog, a very short blog entry called Polyglot Programming, where I made the observation that there are more than 200 languages that run on the JVM now. So now, in a lot of projects, you end up mixing and matching languages on the JVM, and it's not nearly as cumbersome as, you, as it used to be because they all produce the same kind of bytecode. So I made this observation, and my colleague Ola Benny uh, took that observation and created what was a really nice concept, which is this kind of pyramid, where he said that statically typed languages are probably on the bottom because they're more verifiable, with dynamic languages a little higher in the stack, and then DSLs kind of sitting on top to modify both of them. Uh, I've updated that pyramid now because one of the contentions in my keynote is that dynamic versus weak, uh, or, or dynamic versus strong, and, and uh, static and typing, all those things really don't matter that much. You can be really effective in a strongly dynamically typed language. JavaScript has shown you can be really effective in a weakly dynamically typed language. Uh, uh, I think the much more important characteristic now is imperative or functional. And so I've updated that idea of a pyramid where I have functional programming language on the core because that's really where you want your important business rules and persistence and algorithms. Functional programming languages are more deterministic. Uh, they feature immutability. They favor immutability. Um, and if you have more immutable things, that means you have a smaller testing footprint because when you write unit tests, you're testing that state got transformed from one place to another. Well, if everything's immutable, there are very few more opportunities for state get transformed incorrectly. And so uh, I think on the bottom layer, you want more functional languages and functional things like even functional databases and things like that. As you get closer to the user, you can use more imperative and state-based languages, which make a lot easier to handle state on the purposes of UI. But I, and then I think domain-specific languages kind of roll up and down that whole stack. I think Link is a great example of a functional DSL that you would use at the core level of your uh, architecture, uh, all the, the various domain-specific languages to make it easier to write Swing. So there's Swibby and Ruby and there's Swing Builder and Groovy. Those are a good example of imperative DSLs that run closer to the user. Um, but I think the really important thing now is that you want the thing that has the most determinism to run the most important parts of your system. And I think that's increasingly going to be uh, functional programming languages or if not even explicitly functional programming languages using those techniques. So a great example of one of those techniques in the architectural space is CQRS, the Command Query Responsibility Separation, because one of the really complicated things we deal with is being able to do in-place updates in a database. Well, if you can separate the inserts from the reads, then all of a sudden your architecture gets much simpler. That's a good example of a kind of functional flavored architecture of separating those concerns so that you can optimize on either side of it. Now, one of the main topics here at the conference is the change. Uh, IT world is changing. For example, we have cloud computing, we have um, distributed environments, we have uh, multi-core uh, systems. Um, why do you think uh, functional programming is becoming more and more important in this context of change? Well, uh, 
Certainly, uh, part of the change is that we're getting much more resources in terms of overhead, memory, processing power, uh, scale, and so fun functional programming languages take advantage of that really nicely. Uh, I think that's a, a, a minor thing. I think that uh, architecturally, we really have to think about change as a first class thing. I think that's something that uh, doesn't exist at the language level of programming languages, it exists much more at a higher level like architecture. So the other thing that I'm talking about at this conference a lot is continuous delivery, uh, which is an also a big topic here. And one of the observations I make in my continuous delivery talk is that uh, the only thing I can say for sure about your architecture in five years is that it probably won't look like it does now. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I'm pretty sure it won't look like what it looks like now. And what that tells me is that as architects, we need to get better at accommodating change. And that's a lot of what continuous delivery is about, is isolating things so you can change them in isolation from other things. So I think that's a, a pretty common theme up and down the kind of software stack is trying to architect things for change. Because the other observation I make is that yesterday's best practices become tomorrow's anti-patterns. So uh, for a long time, we invested a lot of time and effort in creating giant application servers and big industrial sync database servers to share thread and other kind of precious resources well, now our biggest problem is not resource limitations, because resources are cheap and free. It's coupling, having all these things coupled to everything else. And so that's really what we're doing architecturally now, is decoupling all those pieces from one another. And once we get that exercise done, we'll find something else at the pain point, and we'll start pursuing that. I think you used the term agile architecture, or perhaps emergent architectures. What does that mean? <laughs> Another talk I did was on agile architecture and design, and part of the continuous delivery architecture space is this idea of evolutionary architecture and emergent design. Evolutionary architecture is about building architectural elements that you can evolve slowly over time, uh, mostly by building component or service-based systems and honoring this kind of domain-driven design concept of a bounded context where, and from a continuous delivery standpoint, that typically means logically and physically separated from the rest of the ecosystem. But once you get to that place, and it's very easy to evolve those uh, services because uh, they have a well-established contract with everybody else. As long as you change behind that contract or interface, then you can change it in any way that you like, including changing out physical infrastructure like databases and other things like that if they're not coupled to everything else in your entire system. The emergent design is a lot of techniques. Once you have evolutionary architecture in place, you can let the design kind of evolve slowly over time. So that was the other talk I did here, and that's really the engineering, the, some of the more advanced engineering parts of uh, continuous delivery as an overall subject. Okay, thank you very much, Neil, and enjoy the conference. Yep, thank you very much, glad to be here.